Two days ago, on the 4th of July, 2016, the Juno spacecraft entered orbit around the planet Jupiter after a five-year journey from Earth. Why do we care? Because Jupiter is the second most important planet in the universe, at least from our point of view, and it holds the secrets to the formation of the solar system. <laughs> Jupiter is a monster. It's by far the largest and most massive thing in our solar system after the Sun. It may only have a thousandth of the Sun's mass, but it weighs more than all the other planets combined, two and a half times more. Jupiter's enormous gravity influences the orbit of all the planets in the solar system. In fact, its effect during the first billion years of the solar system's formation defined the positions of all planetary orbits. Today, we're going to see why, without Jupiter, Earth as we know it would not exist. But first, let's talk about the planet itself. Jupiter was probably the first planet to start forming in our system. It likely grew as fragments of rock and ice clung to each other in the disk of debris and gas surrounding the infant sun, the protoplanetary disk. It grew to at least 10 and maybe over 40 times the mass of the Earth before it had enough gravity to start holding on to the 300-ish Earth masses of hydrogen and helium that make up most of the planet today. That solid core now comprises at most 15% of the planet's mass. The bulk of Jupiter is thought to be in the form of metallic hydrogen fluid, a strange theoretical state of hydrogen existing only at extreme densities. The conductivity of metallic hydrogen is thought to result in the enormous electric currents that produce Jupiter's prodigious magnetic field. It's 20,000 times the strength of Earth's field, giving Jupiter the brightest auroras in the solar system. Jupiter patrols the outer solar system at an average distance of 5.2 astronomical units. That's 5.2 times Earth's average distance from the Sun. Its ponderous orbit takes around 12 years. In the wake of its intense gravitational field, it drags with it its own mini solar system of at least 67 moons and a faint ring system. That gravitational influence extends through the entire solar system. Earth's own Milankovitch cycles, periodic changes in Earth's orbit and spin, are largely driven by Jupiter's influence and give us our cycles of glaciation. Even the Sun fills Jupiter's tug. The centre of mass of the Sun-Jupiter system lies just above the solar surface, and both the Sun and Jupiter circle this point. And then of course there's Jupiter's role as cosmic Roomba. Its powerful gravity clears up some of the most dangerous comets before they could collide with the Earth. I'm talking about the rare long period comets that orbit the Sun with periods of hundreds to many thousands of years. But Jupiter is less like a loyal hound guarding our door. It's more like a giant monster stalking the edge of the garden of the inner solar system. It keeps away some dangerous intruders, but is itself not safe by any means. Although it probably intercepts some of the most worrying comets that cross its orbit, it also perturbs the orbits of asteroids in the asteroid belt and can send them plummeting towards the Earth. But the havoc caused by Jupiter now is nothing compared to the earliest days of the solar system. See, Jupiter probably didn't form in its current orbital location. See, the early solar system was a messy place. At first there was the gassy, dusty, protoplanetary disk, and then a mess of asteroids and planetesimals left over from the formation of the planets. There are no stable orbits in this sort of environment. A planet can lose angular momentum to the debris, causing its orbit to shrink. The planet migrates inwards. In a similar way to a satellite falling to the Earth due to dragging against the upper atmosphere. A planet can even migrate outwards, stealing angular momentum from the debris. Astrophysicists have run many computer simulations to find formation scenarios that lead to the configuration of planets that we see today. There's more than one possibility because we don't know exactly how the formation of planets started. However, almost all scenarios have Jupiter rampaging through the protoplanetary disk before settling into its current orbit, or driving other planets to do the same. 
I'm going to outline a possible scenario for the first billion years of the solar system. It combines two of the strongest contenders of formation models. One possible scenario for the first half billion years is the Grand Tack hypothesis. In this model, Jupiter first formed closer to the Sun at around 3.5 astronomical units. Within its first millions of years of planetary life, it was still embedded in the thick protoplanetary disk. Drag from that gas would have sapped angular momentum from Jupiter, causing it to migrate inwards until it stalled at around 1.5 AU. Saturn would have quickly followed until it fell into orbital resonance with Jupiter. Three of Saturn's orbits to every two of Jupiter's. This changed the way the planets interacted with the surrounding disk, and in fact, they would then have slowly migrated back outwards until Jupiter reached its current position. This change in direction is the tack in the Grand Tack. Why propose such a complicated scenario? Well, computer simulations show that something like this may be expected given the right starting position for Jupiter. But it also solves several problems with the way our inner solar system is currently laid out. Most simulations predict that a protoplanetary disk capable of forming Venus and Earth should also have formed another massive planet, at least half of Earth's mass, in Mars's location. But Mars is a measly 10% of Earth's mass. The idea is that Jupiter lumbered through that part of the protoplanetary disk, clearing it of a lot of the material it needed to build another large planet in Mars's location. Another clue is that other real exoplanetary systems tend to have super-Earths, rocky planets several times the mass of our own planet. Our solar system has none. Jupiter's early rampage into the inner solar system would have sent such planets spiralling into the Sun, leaving only a limited amount of material to then build the current crop of terrestrial planets. The asteroid belt is also an interesting clue. It's comprised of a mixture of materials from both the inner and the outer solar system. And that's exactly what you might expect if Jupiter passed through that region in early days. The grand tack hypothesis is still just that, a hypothesis. Slightly more accepted, although still unproven, is the scenario of the Nice model. The events it describes starts after the protoplanetary disk had evaporated, so chronologically after the grand tack, although the Nice model was proposed earlier. The solar system at this point had all its planets, eight, and maybe nine of them, but also a huge amount of leftover junk. However, the Nice model posits that the orbits of the four gas giants were much more tightly clustered back then. Jupiter would be roughly in its current location after any early destructive wanderings in the first half billion years, but Saturn, Uranus and Neptune were all closer in than their current locations. Beyond Neptune was a vast sea of planetesimals, many thousands of tiny icy worlds. At some point, Saturn's orbit once again fell into resonance with Jupiter's, but now two Saturnian orbits to every one Jovian. This amplified Jupiter's gravitational influence on Saturn, causing Saturn's eccentricity to increase. This in turn pushed Uranus and Neptune further out to their current locations. As the three outer gas giants ploughed through the great field of planetesimals, they scattered this material through the solar system. This is hypothesized to have caused the massive meteor activity of the late heavy bombardment re-liquefying Earth's newly solidified crust. Oh, and it may also have nearly ejected Planet Nine, which we may have recently found lurking far, far out beyond the Kuiper Belt. So that's where we are. We have a tiny Mars, no super-Earths, a weird mixed up asteroid belt, and an early obliteration of Earth's surface, and perhaps a missing ninth planet. Thanks, Jupiter. Now the scenarios I laid out are by no means confirmed. Whether the solar system's formation really happened this way or by some completely different scenario, we can be sure that Jupiter's influence on the early solar system is the key to how it got to its current state. One giant unknown is where Jupiter first formed. Answer that and we can nail down these simulations to truly understand our planet's origin. The key to finding Jupiter's birth orbit is in its internal composition. 
And that is one of the things the Juno spacecraft was sent to discover. Stay tuned. We'll keep you up to date right here on Space Time. Guys, if you think Jupiter is cool, you have to check out our buddies over at Shanks FX. They've created the most awesome model of Jupiter's weird atmosphere. See how they did it. Also, an announcement. I'm going to be traveling, so we'll have to skip next week's release, sorry. We'll be back with Astro News and the Challenge Answer the following week. We recently talked about the origin of quantum theory with Max Planck's derivation of an equation to describe the black body spectrum. Let's see what you guys had to say. So many of you, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, point out that the sun is actually white and not yellow. Well, the sun usually appears white to our eyes and so to our brains. And since the entire concept of color only exists in our brains, it's reasonable to say that the sun is truly white. But this observed whiteness is a result of the fact that our color sensitivity is limited. The sun does emit a bit more light in the yellowy green part of the electromagnetic spectrum compared to the blue and the red parts on either side. This is due to its black body spectrum peaking in that yellowy green region. A more color sensitive eye or electronic detector would see the sun as yellowish green. Our eyes can't register the difference in brightness across the visible part of the spectrum, so we register the color as white. A few of you rightly note that quantum mechanics isn't needed to resolve Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. So I said that the assumption of infinite divisibility of space was a problem with the scenario in this paradox, but the real resolution is that there are different types of infinity. Zeno complains that to catch a tortoise, Achilles needs to complete an infinite number of tasks, closing the remaining gap every time he reaches the tortoise's last position. However, it doesn't need to take an infinite amount of time to complete an infinite number of tasks, as long as the time taken for those tasks gets small enough. For example, if the time taken to catch the tortoise is, say, half a minute at first, and then the time halves at every step, then you can write that total time series as half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth of a minute, etc. That's what we call a convergent series, because it doesn't add up to infinity even if you do an infinite number of these additions. In this case, it adds up to one, well, one minute. That's how long Achilles takes to complete the infinite steps and overtake the tortoise. Many of you noticed that the tortoise we used in Zeno's Paradox is actually a turtle. And not just any turtle, but Great Atuin, the giant star turtle, bearer of Discworld. Well spotted. As a physicist, I usually approximate everything as a sphere, including planets. So approximating a tortoise as a turtle is actually pretty good. Let's <laughs> go.